Good, I'm delighted to have you all here today. And I'm also delighted to have Marianne Perry as our speaker. She's dedicated to caring for the natural world through conservation, green burial practices. She serves as a sexton at the Forest Conservation Burial Ground outside of Ashland, Oregon. And she's going to talk to you about how she ended up doing this as well. Thank you, Marianne. Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Marianne. Yeah, I'm happy um, that you are joining us and grateful to uh, Jane and Kim and Marina for um, the support. I am a, a humble graduate, proud, a very proud, humble graduate. And so it's been really sweet to reconnect um, with the, the Ollie Humboldt the last couple of terms. Um, so I just want to um, start by saying that I have put a couple of things in the chat, a few links and resources that you might explore on your own. Um, one is uh, the Arcata Green Burial Feasibility Study that was completed by um, some Cal Poly Humboldt students last year, um, working with the city of Arcata and the possibility of um, having a, a burial ground on city um, property. And the other was a Funeral Consumers Alliance of Humboldt Link, which um, you all have had uh, uh, an active uh, Funeral Consumers Alliance uh, group for, I think, since the 70s. Um, so they're all about education and advocacy for making sure that people know their rights and they're, um, you know, are treated fairly in the funeral industry. So they're, um, they just had a recent newsletter and they have their annual meeting coming up in April. So um, check that out if you're wanting to get more connected in that way. Um, yeah, so Jane asked me to share just a little bit about how, why I'm the person uh, presenting this information to you, how I came to um, this work, and um, I sh shared with her uh, just briefly, I, um, well, gosh, it's getting more and more years ago every day, I guess, <laughs> but um, a little over uh, 10 years ago, I guess 12 years ago, I experienced a, a sudden death in my own life and uh, found myself planning for someone that I loved and who had left no plans for themselves. And uh, shortly after that, I was uh, compelled to put my own plans in place, even just, you know, basic things like an advanced directive and things like that. So um, started learning a lot about that and getting into that. And shortly after, heard about home funerals and the um, our right in, in most places to care for our own after death outside of the funeral industry and became a, home a trained home funeral guide and became really passionate about that work. And uh, that is pretty closely tied in some ways to green or natural burial and started learning more about that and reading books and uh, joining groups and things like that and uh, connecting with others in my community around end of life and green burial. And about four years ago, heard about a ranch in our area, Willow Witt Ranch, where, um, I mean, I was already connected with the ranch in other ways, but heard that they were interested in opening a natural burial ground and they pulled together some community volunteers who um, wanted to help explore and research that process and go through all the permitting and all of that. And so I joined that group and uh, we opened the burial ground in June of 2020 and uh, have now entered uh, 31 folks and uh, and then people pre-plan with us um, for the future as well. So um, <clears throat> the whole time have been offering community education around um, our end of life options um, and caring for our own and uh, disposition options like green burial. So that is how I came to be here with you all now. And uh, yeah, once everything kind of went online, I started just offering uh, education um, in, in our region since uh, so many people were interested in learning online, especially through um, through OLLI programs. So. That's kind of the background there. And today I'm gonna to be sharing just a little bit, uh, kind of a, a brief overview of green burial and, and what it is. And you'll hear me use the terms green burial, natural burial, and also conservation burial. And so I'll talk more about um, what that kind of layer um, adds to the mix. And I'm gonna show a couple short video clips of um, some other folks at other natural burial grounds throughout. Um, there's, you'll hear from one in Florida and then you'll hear from our conservation um, kind of manager here at the forest. And then we'll hear from one up um, just on the other side of the Columbia Gorge in Washington. 
Eagle Memorial Preserve. And then, like I said, there's, there is a group um, in the Humboldt area that um, Michael Furness is, was, um, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he um, was working to organize people and kind of um, bring about the possibility of a, a natural burial ground um, in your area. So I'm not sure where folks are at with that, but that feasibility study could be a cool thing for you to check out or um, searching, um, searching up Michael Furness's contact information. Um, before um, I start to share some of the information about Green Burial and show some slides with you, are there any just quick questions or comments before we launch right in? Oh, hello. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, my name is Patricia Ellard Abler, and I um. I'm just interested. We, my husband, unfortunately, died almost two years ago, and we, um, we buried him in Blue Lake and mm. a lovely green burial. And I would love to, you know, be a resource for anyone too. I worked with Paul's Chapel, and um, we just really had a wonderful experience. So we're just uh, anyway. There we go. Good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Anything else out there? Okay, all right. So um, the photos that you'll be seeing here are, um, except for the cover photo that you'll see first, but all the rest are, are taken um, at the forest conservation burial ground shared with uh, permission by the families. And let's see there, yep, oh, I'm sorry. Um, where did that go? Give me just a second. Thanks for your patience. <clears throat> okay, there we are. Okay. All right, so we'll be talking about uh, green burials as the, the greenest way to go. And again, if you um, have a question, you're welcome to pop it into the chat or just unmute yourself and share that way is welcome too. Um, so this uh, this cover photo here is a, a shrouded body. Um, and it, these are King Carico shrouds. They're made uh, down in the Bay Area. So it's one option for a a burial wrap or container. So when we talk about green burial, and like I said, you'll hear some different names. So you'll hear natural burial, you'll hear green burial. And um, over the last years, folks are also using the term conservation burial. So conservation burial is where a, a different level of care for the land. So the land is kind of the priority of um, either doing conservation work on the land, restoration work, or otherwise engaging kind of the highest level best practices to impact the land in the least um, least ways possible. So in, when I say green burial, it could be you know any of those layers, and uh, you might hear of folks that have had uh, you know parts of a green burial and even in a conventional cemetery. Um, so there, someone might be buried in a shroud, um, but not necessarily in a conservation space where care for the land is um, done in specific ways. So I'll try to kind of define those terms and, and clarify them as we speak to them. But generally speaking, green burial is interment in the, in the ground in a way that does not inhibit decomposition. And actually, there's a lot of things that are done to encourage decomposition. So one of those is the shallower grave. Um, not embalming the body, um, using completely biodegradable um, burial materials, whether that's the casket or shroud, and then no vault or grave liners. So not burying, uh, you know, metals, uh, plastics, or concrete that those are usually made of. Um, so that is kind of the basics of what makes it a green burial. And so, um, there are, of course, layers to that. And, you know, anytime that we sort of name something, um, so if we call something green burial, then that name can start to 
take on many definitions. So there are some people in the field of green burial and, and especially that are really towards the conservation burial work that um, really don't want to call anything a green burial unless it really meets all of these things. So there are conventional lawn cemeteries that will allow elements of this, like they might require a vault or grave liner, but they might allow the family to just um, invert the the vault or grave liner and not put the lid on so that the bottom has access to the earth and really the the um the reason that vault or grave liners are used is really more of a cemetery maintenance thing so when a grave is dug and the casket is placed or the shrouded body the soil is going to subside over time no matter what and so the vault or grave liner delays that time frame so that the subsidence happens um more gradually and later. And so when they are mowing these lawn cemeteries with large mowers, the ground is stays, you know, nice and flat longer and um, it's easier for cemetery maintenance and then keeping a nice flat surface for, um, you know, visitors and such. It's also a huge use of resources that we're um, putting into the earth for, you know, yeah. forever. Right. Um, so some of the science of green burial. So, um, one is that the graves are shallower. And again, this might be a thing that if you're going, wanting a version of a green burial in a conventional cemetery, they might not agree to um, just by policy. But so in, in true green burial, we want a shallower grave because we want the body to decompose. That's, you know, to be absorbed by the fungi and, and then into the, the plant roots and the tree roots. So that is the intention. So if you've ever dug a hole that's deeper than three or four feet, you know that you can start to see kind of the life activity decrease once you get below three or four feet. And uh, so we want that shallower grave so that the body is in the most active part of the soil. There's also the potential for using uh, land that maybe a six feet depth is not um, possible. And then, you know, people talk about the toxicity of our own bodies. Um, and really the, the magic of soil is able to do all the right you know, things with our bodies um, in terms of breaking them down. And so there isn't, um, you know, reports or any research as of now that I'm aware of, of contamination in natural burial grounds from the decomposing bodies. And when we do see um, reports of contamination from conventional uh, cemeteries, it's really more from everything else that's buried, not the body itself. It's the toxic glues and other uh, chemicals in the caskets really that are buried so that's where the contamination is coming from and even embalming fluid is said to be sort of neutralized um, by the soil and not not an issue um, necessarily from or at least not not a, a research documented issue that we know of it's really embalming the dangers of embalming are really uh, to the embalmers themselves um, who have a higher uh, incidence of cancer just from exposure to the embalming fluids so no water or soil contamination that has been uh, researched or reported as of now, and also no animal disturbance, even though it's a shallower grave. And uh, so the, the Green Burial Council, which is a national organization that um, certifies cemeteries and burial grounds, um, funeral home practices, and also uh, funeral service products like shrouds and caskets and other um, urns and things like that. They say um, that as long as uh, the soil is 18 inches from the body to the surface of the soil, that that's enough of a smell barrier to prevent uh, wildlife from accessing the body. Um, so not an issue there. Um, one of the things that I most appreciate about um, this type of disposition is the opportunity to bring environmental uh, practices and uh, philosophy to this part of our life cycle. And so you can see here that it's really a community experience if um, if the family and friends want that. So in these photos, you know, the age range of people participating in closing these graves is from you know, six or seven to um, 94. So there's really some way for everyone to engage in this process. And you can see here, um, the, the, the graves, well, I don't know that you can see that, but I'll say that the, the graves are hand dug um, at the forest and um, 
different cemeteries do this differently. Some do use a backhoe, but our forest area and the forest floor is uh, really sensitive to disturbance. And so we are choosing not to bring heavy machinery back into the forest at this time. Um, so with hand digging, there's the opportunity to, you can see in that top photo there, to separate the soil layers so that the root layer is kind of taken off kind of in chunks like sod and then set aside and then the top soil is set in its own pile and then that largest pile is really everything below kind of about the first foot or so, which um, is pretty clay rich soil in our area. And then the soil, of, of course, is replaced back in the layers that it um, existed in originally. And so within months, depending on the time of year, we're able to see, you know, the plants sprouting right back on the grave mound um, that spring and summer. And it also, you know, allows the, the simplicity of this type of burial allows for families to engage in the process as much as they want. So um, a lot of natural burial grounds welcome families to come and friends to come help prepare the grave if they would like. Even throughout just the burial process, there's the process of um, lining the grave with evergreen boughs or other greenery, covering the body with evergreen boughs, and then we cover the final mound um, just to protect it from erosion um, or you know the sunlight um, as the roots are getting reestablished, putting more boughs on top. So lots of opportunities for people to engage even carrying their loved one out to the grave, lowering them down with, you can see those lowering straps um, in that top photo there. And then also just encouraging people for burial shrouds or containers to use local resources. Um, the, the, in the previous photo, the, the person that was shrouded, they, that was an old cotton sheet from their linen closet that they chose as their shroud and then just put a, a solid wood board um, inside it under the body so that we could carry and lower, you know, more easily, you know, or making your own casket, um, you know, funeral homes sell these cardboard, they call them, you know, kind of basic container cremation container. I think they're wonderful for green burial. It's just a simple raw natural cardboard that can be decorated if people want, but it's also, um, I think, a really low uh, impact on the environment to use that kind of container. Um, so, you know, in conventional cemeteries, often there's the use of pesticides and herbicides that are, you know, in, endangering the workers, but also our, our communities um, as those those chemicals leach into the rest of the land and then requiring uh, you know, vaults, which are, you know, resource intensive. And then, of course, the embalming fluid piece. <clears throat> so a lot of folks have uh, chosen cremation because I think that they're, in, in comparison to a full-on conventional burial, they are the more, you know, the less resource intensive choice. But you can see from here that there, it, it's quite a bit of um, energy uh, input and, and the resulting, um, pollution, you know, from just from the cremation process. And, you know, now we are, oh, here's uh, some information just about resources um, within a year in the U.S. that we are, um, you know, either burying or just putting out into the environment. And so, you know, quite a bit of concrete and uh, embalming fluid being put out there and uh, metals and then just the use of fossil fuels for um, that all of those things entail. So I know that this is kind of small um, and you can find this on the Green Burial Council's website if you want to see a, a larger image and zoom into that. And we have other disposition options that uh, maybe you've heard of as well. So on the left there, you're seeing uh, alkaline hydrolysis or water cremation, which um, they say uses about an eighth of the um, energy input as compared to flame cremation. So you're placed in this, uh, this machine that you see here that's a highly alkaline solution. So basically it dissolves all the soft tissue. And then just like in flame cremation, the, the bones, um, that are left over are then pulverized and returned to the family. And um, this is legal in close to 10 states, I think at this point, maybe more now, um, but you know, it's legal here in my state in Oregon, but I don't know of any operators. So it's, you know, it's a whole machine to be purchased or leased and to maintain. And I'm just not sure that it has had the, um, you know, that the consumers have taken to it as, as much as maybe in other places. 
And then on the right here, you're seeing uh, what's called one of the cradles, and this is at Herland Forest. Um, this woman is Elizabeth Fournier. She's a funeral director um, here from Oregon out up near Portland. She's also called the Green Reaper. If you want to look her up, she wrote um, the Green Burial Guidebook. Um, so in this in this human composting, this cradle, the body is placed in there with a ton of wood chips and uh, sometimes uh, alfalfa and straw and um, was first legalized in Washington state um, through a company called Recompose. If you want to look them up, their website is um, pretty user friendly that explains the process and um, how they go about it. So these folks up in Herland Forest, they built these cradles themselves and then, you know, lay the body um, in there and add all the wood chips and all of that. And the the um, cradle is actually on a track that you can kind of see there. And so I think every couple of weeks is my understanding, they roll them back and forth, but there's no nothing else added, no energy input. And then in six weeks, uh, you know, it's completely decomposed, apparently no DNA traces or anything like that. And uh, folks can either take back the whole something like a cubic yard of basically uh, ready to go garden compost, or um, or you can just take back kind of the urn amount and they will use the compost um, for other, you know, restoration work that they're doing. So um, yeah, that's another option for us. Um, this this uh, graphic and photo sort of um, is to communicate that it, for a lot of natural burial grounds, there, there's also there's other things happening that are connected with the land. So it's often that the burial ground is part of a larger picture of recreation, agriculture, and or education. And so at the forest, we're you know the forest uh, conservation burial ground is about four almost forty acres, and we're located on a ranch, Willow Witt Ranch, that's um, just over about four almost four hundred and fifty acres. And on the ranch, we also have a certified organic farm. We also have a nonprofit called The Crest um, in our in Oregon outdoor school for elementary school kids is um, mandated in our law. So we're one of the sites in the state where kids come for three days um, to learn about the forests and and all of the, the ecosystems there. So and then we're also, a, you know, a wedding venue and all of these other things. So it's really like this kind of life cycle experience. Um, and like I said, that is true for several other natural burial grounds where community engagement and life affirming activities are just as important as the burial um, piece. Um, folks often ask kind of about the, the cost comparison and of course it varies widely. Um, purchasing a cemetery plot is, is similar to kind of real estate really. So it's all about, you know, location, 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 I guess. Um, so um, this, like I said, varies greatly, but um, in general, I think in, in natural burial, the, um, you know, what is needed is just less. So there's, you're not going to have to pay for, um, you know, a vault or grave liner and even kind of the headstone, you know, some natural burial grounds allow headstones, some don't, some use, you know, survey markers. Um, at the forest, we, we install a three and a half inch bronze survey marker on an 18 inch piece of rebar at the head of every grave. And then uh, stone markers are optional. And then there's limits on the sizing and how high it can be raised and all of that, because we want, um, we want it to look like a, a healthy forest first and foremost, and uh, a burial ground second. And this was compiled, um, it's getting a little bit old now from 2017 of looking at, um, you can see there on the bottom, uh, you know, not, not a huge amount of, uh, of burial grounds and cemeteries, but a general idea. Um, these are our local options in our area. Um, so where you can have a green burial, um, you know, I always uh, encourage people to approach your your own local cemeteries and such. It's, you know, whatever, you know, people running these establishments, you know, the more people that they hear from that are interested in something, the more that they are going to become aware of it, tune into it, and possibly open to the idea. And so in, in cemeteries, there's... Um, you know, some of them are what's called hybrids. So they will allow 
green burial or at least some elements of a green burial intermixed within the conventional burial sites. Um, others that are called hybrids have set aside specific areas that are the green burial area that maybe they even manage a little bit differently. Um, so asking about that, educating yourselves and then educating others. I mean, there's something really convenient and uh, yeah, of being buried, you know, close to to where you're living or in your own community, even though we can still, you know, be shipped wherever we want really to be interred wherever. But, um, you know, communicating with folks in your own area is something that I advocate for. And uh, the Green Burial Council is, a, like I said, a, a nice resource, a national nonprofit. And so they help um, educate and even certify, you know, funeral directors themselves and then cemeteries as well. And then I said funeral service products too, like shrouds and urns. And um, and for, for the, the Green Burial Council also does this certifying of uh, cemeteries and burial grounds themselves. So the three levels of certification, I mentioned hybrid. So that's when there's a mixture of conventional practices with green practices. There's natural, and then there's something called conservation. And so the difference between natural and conservation, um, one is burial density. So in a natural burial ground or certified at the natural level, the, the burial density per acre, the average burial density can't exceed um, 600 burials. And a conventional or hybrid cemetery is around 1200 um, burials per acre with the plots being about eight by three. And then a conservation level certified burial ground, the density can't be greater than an average of 400 per acre. And the land also has to be held under a conservation easement. So conservation easements are um, usually managed by land trust organizations. So these, this is a third party that um, really sort of provides oversight and usually an annual um, check in on the land and the practices to ensure that a certain level of practices and management are actually happening on the land. And so um, to put a conservation easement on property can uh, devalue it actually because it limits, you know, monetarily because it limits what can happen on that land. But it, it's a layer of protection and a, a, a guarantee of the land being cared for in specific ways in perpetuity. So that's the conservation burial status um, th what the certification that certification level um, requires. and and both natural and conservation status to be certified um, at those levels by the Green Burial Council, there has to be an ecological assessment done of the land. So plant surveys, bird surveys, um, invasive species surveys, and then also an operations and kind of management plan of how those things are going to be cared for and taken care of um, over the, the, you know, the life of the cemetery, which, um, you know, is considered forever in, in cemetery land. Um, so here are just some resources that you might be interested in checking out. Um, one that I mentioned earlier, the National Home Funeral Alliance. So they are um, education and advocacy oriented for folks who want to do some element of the death care and after death care process within the family and friends and not hire outside of that. Um, the Green Burial Council um, is a good place. They have a nice photo gallery um, just to see what Green Burial is looking like at different places around the country, but also um, lots of links and blogs and kind of deeper information about all of this. And the Collective for Radical Death Studies, their work is um, geared towards uh, decolonizing uh, death care. And so you may have heard the, the phrase, you know, that death is the great equalizer. And uh, well, that turns out not to be that true. Um, so their their efforts are about bringing some equity to end of life and death care practices and lots of um, helpful and formative uh, magazine articles, blog posts, podcast video links, all of that on their website. And they also have different community groups that do, um, uh, you know, book clubs and, and uh, discussion groups that you might check out. And then the the other on the right hand side, their final rights. Um, this is put out by uh, Funeral Consumers Alliance folks. Um, 
and it's a state-by-state -state guide to all of funeral and after-death care law. Um, and so for those of you that are interested in that level of knowing, um, I found it to be a really great resource, especially in communicating with um, funeral homes, our county like medical examiner, um, hospitals and hospice um, to really have a way to, you know, really cite the law and what is possible um, so that people feel comfortable and safe knowing that they're doing, um, if they're doing things on their own, that they're doing it um, legally and safely. Um, Marianne, you have a yeah. question in the chat. Thank you. Of course. I'm not seeing the chat. Okay, there it is. Your website shows pictures of the Oregon Ranch with snow. How do you, oh, so burials in winter. Yeah, it's real. <laughs> um, we just had our, um, excuse me, our snowiest burial yet um, a week ago. And so um, we are at 5,000 feet and uh, to most years, 2008 and previous, there was a solid winter snowpack at the ranch, three to four feet that held on for months. And that hasn't happened uh, since yeah, winter of 2009 was the first that became really intermittent. So we'll get a big snow and then it'll melt the next week and then we'll get a little bit more. Um, so we happened to have a couple of feet last week for this burial. Um, where we're located, our road is on county land and normally is not plowed. It's um, We're surrounded by a Bureau of Land Management land. So we contract with them to do all the plowing up to our ranch. So the road, um, clearing the road is not an issue. And then um, just making sure that the family or friends um, or the funeral directors, if the family has hired one, have all wheel drive or four wheel drive to get to us. And then, um, you know, the snowpack isn't um, isn't significant enough that the ground really freezes. So beyond the first maybe frozen inch or two, the preparation of the grave is really pretty much the same. Um, we do have to do snow removal, of course, a path to the grave and around the grave. And uh, we encourage folks to um, you know, if it's an at need burial to choose a spot that is uh, closer to the parking area. And if they've pre-planned with us and they've chosen a spot that's farther back and we can't get there because of snow, then we would have to ask the family to move to a, excuse me, a spot that's uh, more accessible. And, and on the family side, you know, if a death has occurred and we had a big snowstorm, like I said, it, the, it's not that the snow really sticks around for months anymore. Um, or hasn't at least for the last year. So the family um, also has the option of, you know, keeping their loved one's body in refrigeration. And um, when kept cold, our bodies stay uh, lovely and intact for many, many weeks actually. So, um, you know, if they wanted to have the burial later, that would be an option too, you know, if they don't wanna move to a closer uh, spot. And uh, you'll hear from, um, well, we won't hear from her video today, but there is a burial ground that um, I really love, Green Springs Natural Cemetery outside of Ithaca, New York, and they have a big uh, toboggan that they use uh, to transport the body to the grave in the winter snow months that, um, yeah, looks really, really beautiful. Um, so one of the things that um, we offer and that other burial grounds have different ways of offering is a community uh, support fund. So for folks who um, come to us for an at-need burial that don't have all the funds um, available to them. We've um, People contribute to this fund as kind of an in lieu of flowers so that then we can um, offer this um, th these monies to people um, who can't afford burial with us. So just so you know that that's something that exists and um, with us. Um, so that is our the slides there. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And um, I just saw another question about medical devices removed prior to green burial. Um, we don't actually. Um, I know that that might involve burying some small amounts of plastic. And we've, uh, yeah, just decided to go with that. Um, so we don't, we leave everything inside of you that uh, is already in there. Any questions or comments before we move on to our next piece here? That's a great presentation. Thank you, Marianne. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions from anybody here? <clears throat> okay. I I know someone who was actually buried here in Blue Lake 
and apparently it was a very lovely burial mm. so yeah yeah and I know Michael Furness is looking for another site okay because Blue Lake is apparently full yeah I've heard that so okay on yeah. we go good okay so I want to show you a video that's um just uh, less than seven minutes here, but it's from uh, my colleague, uh, Jody Bueller, who runs White Eagle Memorial Preserve that I mentioned up in um, Goldendale, Washington. And uh, yeah, just her sharing about their their work up there. And actually before that, I wanna share um, a video also that's from White Eagle, but of the, the a family's burial process experience so that you can get a sense of what does it kind of look like from, from start to finish of folks uh, preparing a grave and such. And I did see- There are two more questions. I see that. So I see, can we make a reservation? The Green Burial Site in Blue Lake said that they would take registration. Yeah, so it depends on the, the um, the cemetery is kind of structure and set up at the forest. We do pre-need planning. So folks that are purchasing for the future and typically people come and visit, they choose their spot in the forest and then they, um, you know, make the, the contract arrangements. And uh, do I live at the ranch? I live down in town um, year round. Only the owner lives at the, the ranch, Suzanne Willow. And then uh, May through October, we run a whole summer camp, campground, wedding, uh, family event space. And so we do have a campground host that lives at the ranch May through October. And then, of course, people camping and tenting and uh, we have some farm stays and that kind of thing. So uh yeah, there is a lot of activity up there, but year round, just one person lives up there and I live uh, down here in the city of Ashland. Does the landowner get money from this burial or is it the easement benefits that they get? So the they, so it is a, the yeah, so the, yeah. yeah, the ranch and the burial ground are um, private businesses. And so, um, some others operate on different structures like nonprofit structures or religious nonprofit structures, um, but we are a private business. Um, and so, yeah, the reality is that most of the funds that, um, well, if anyone's done farming or ranching, you know how lucrative that business is. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, really any uh, revenue that we generate at this point, we are um, investing in both the land for our, you know, paying our employees to do the conservation work um, of thinning and burn piles and all of that work that we do for fire prevention. Um, and then also the development of the burial ground itself. Uh, we completed a, a with an architect, a long-term land use master plan for development of, you know, things like paths, a, a nicer parking lot, some waterless toilets down at the burial ground area, um, a covered structure for families to gather under. Um, so all of those things, and that's what we are uh, trying to, you know, um, build our funds for at this point. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to share with you again. And here's our video.
I will tell you, they nourish the sore earth. You shall ask, what reason is there for winter? And I will tell you, to bring about new leaves. You shall ask, why are the leaves so green? And I will tell you, because they are rich with life. You shall ask, why must summer end? And I will tell you, so that leaves will die. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate their work. Um, so someone asked about states where it's legal to bury a person on their own land and other private land. Um, so again, it depends where you are and often by county. Um, here in uh, Jackson County, here in Southern Oregon, it's uh, very easy, um, luckily, to bury on private land so long as you live outside of city limits. It's as simple as um, you know, adding it to your deed and showing the location and uh, being a, you know, certain distance from open water. And then, um, you know, it's an hour down at the county planning department. Um, it's, yeah, like I said, different in every state and every county. It seems like, um, yeah, we're, I, I would say that we're on the pretty uh, liberal side here in Southern Oregon. It seems like other folks have more kind of hoops to jump through or it's not legal at all in other places for private land burial. So something to look into in your uh, county is, you know, simple as maybe calling down to the county planning uh, department to ask what's possible, but limited in, in many places. Yeah. Do you deal with people who want to do cremation and then distribute the ashes or bury the ashes? Yeah, yeah, so we do both. We inter cremated remains and human compost and also scatter. Um, cremated remains are actually pretty toxic. Um, some people say that the best place for cremated remains is on your mantle. Um, so they're uh, pretty, uh, very salty actually and alkaline. And so um, 
plant roots and such will avoid them and they can definitely uh, kill plants. So with the, the forest um, and in other natural burial grounds, they are um, mixing them with um, compost or um, there's a, a commercial product called Let Your Love Grow, where they have um, you know formulated some kind of mixture that um, you can add to the cremated remains to sort of neutralize or at least dilute them. Um, yeah, so, you know, scattering them anywhere near water or, you know, a waterway is uh, not not the best uh, practice. And, and you know, very few people come to us um, with cremated remains or an interest in that. So it's very low, um, you know, in terms of density and, and volume. So um, we've, you know, like I said, had uh, 32 interments and I think... Uh, two of those have been cremated remains. So the rest have been uh, body burials. This is a really dumb question. Why are cremated remains so toxic? <clears throat> um, well, I mean, toxic in that they, in just the high concentrations of the, the salinity and the, um, the acid. So, um, you know, like the, any, any chemical can be toxic, you know, at, at different concentrations or whatever. So it's not that they're, uh, there's something wrong with them. It's just what's resulting from uh, the bone fragments that are left over. That's what they're composed of. That's what, um, you know, wasn't lost in the incineration process. So it's in the bone, whatever toxins are, are in the bones. Themselves. Yeah, just that. Yeah, I guess just that concentration of, of what's left there. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there's in a the lot animals, of... Animals routinely die in the forest and the bones remain. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't know enough about the science really to say much more than that. Um, but there's definitely some stuff online and more research being done about uh, cremated remains and their, um, you know, the best ways of of dealing with them or their impact um, in the environment. And it is a big part of discussion in uh, the natural burial world because folks are just, yeah, wanting to take care of the land and not, um, you know, not harm what's living out there and finding the best way to do that. And while honoring the, you know, people's right to choose that as a form of disposition and, uh, and still wanting to connect with the, the natural burial piece. Do you by any chance keep in touch with Michael Furness? Not directly. We have been in touch, um, but it, not, not regularly, but yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to be in touch with him, especially for an update on how things are going with finding the land. Yeah, he did do a presentation. Uh, there was a presentation on green burial oh, a year or so ago. And um, at that time, they were looking for another place. Mm, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know if they found one. We haven't heard from him since. So I, okay. I have no idea. I'll try to get in touch with him and see. Yeah. Um, someone asked about, you know, transportation and green burial. Um, and so you know, whether it's the family providing transportation, which it's possible to get the the permits and stuff in place to do your own transportation, um, or you're hiring a funeral home for transportation, but, um, you know, and, and funeral homes are, are willing to transport your body wherever you want to pay them to. Um, so our first burial um, at the forest, the, the gentleman was an Oregonian, but died suddenly in Florida. And they were able to fly him here, you know, on dry ice and still maintain his wishes for, you know, totally natural body preparation and uh, natural burial. So um, it's all all totally possible to be, you know, taken wherever wherever you want. That's good news. Yeah. <laughs> any they, any uh, other questions before I share the next thing with you all? Go ahead. All right, great. Well, thank you for your question so far. I'm glad that the chat piece is uh, working for you. Um, so I wanted to share um, just a little bit from, just so you get another uh, kind of view or um, look on natural burial. I just wanna share a little bit of um, from Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery, which is a, a conservation uh, level certified burial ground. Um, in central Florida, just outside of Gainesville. And uh, you're hearing, you'll hear from two folks, Carlos, um, 
oh, his name is, his last name is escaping me, um, Gonzalez and uh, Freddie Johnson. And so Carlos is the executive director of Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery. And they're in partnership with um, Alachua Land Trust. Um, and then Freddie Johnson, he's kind of one of the, the I would say, kind of the fathers of the conservation burial um, work and, and movement and a uh, long time uh, educator advocate of this work. So they talk a little bit about their actual conservation practices on the land, and then also about how kind of climate change and things are, are impacting that. So it's a longer sharing that they have, but I'm going to jump um, to just a couple of spots and, and uh, yeah, share that with you in just a sec here. and think we should get hmm. give me just a sec i'm not sure why it's not playing for us let's refresh it Okay. which is just in front of you is uh, to provide a natural burial choice uh, that conserves lands, protects land and, and reunites people uh, with the environment in the most natural way. And so it's an honor uh, for me as the executive director to, to be here to share a bit about us and, and our practices. Uh, so a little bit more about who we are. Um, Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery is a conservation burial ground. Uh, we're actually the only classified uh, conservation burial ground in the state of Florida. Uh, there are other natural burial grounds in the state that are working on getting uh, a conservation easement, uh, which if we have time, we can go more into that as to how that helps with this classification. Uh, but we are partnered uh, with Alachua Conservation Trust, uh, a land trust uh, not-for-profit uh, that is based out of Alachua County, the same county that the cemetery is within, uh, and they've been uh, purchasing land to protect and to provide public access since 1988. Uh, and so they are professionals that help us uh, with land management practices um, out in the, in the cemetery. Uh, Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery started back 12, close to 13 years now, back in 2010. Um, and it took a few years for people to develop uh, the plans uh, and get everything lined up to open this special place. Um, and we're fortunate to have one of those people here uh, to, to provide that, that knowledge and, and history. Um, I'm just jumping plus, ahead a little bit. Um, so that's the history. <laughs> thank you for sharing, Freddie. Yeah, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the, the next area that, that we'll dive into uh, will be uh, the cemetery's uh, conservation and restored, restoration practices, um, forms of land management uh, that we do out in the land uh, while uh, respecting those who, who are buried out there. So there is a delicate balance um that we uh, that we take care of uh, in regards to completing burials while simultaneously doing land work um, and so in this photo here uh, this is an example of a prescribed burn um, that is out in the meadow ecosystem we typically do some of these about every two to three years um, given that specific area land that goes through um, that, that form of land management restoration uh, it takes that amount of time for it to really need um, uh, that action so that it can continue to flourish. So a lot of the plant life uh, that is out in the cemetery, especially in this particular habitat, require um, fire so that they can procreate and grow stronger and healthier. Um, mm -hmm. There are other forms of land management uh, that we have uh, throughout the land, um, such as removing invasives. So here you'll see um, one of our interns on the left uh, removing some coral ardesia. Uh, there's a, a ton of others uh, that start to pop up, but we make sure to do our very best in, uh, in managing 
um, those species, uh, and then preparing certain areas um, for, for plantings on the right. Others here um, is uh, necessary tree work for nuisance trees, trees that tend to grow quickly um, and that flourish actually have, after people complete cattle grazing. And so you'll see in, in these photos here, uh, some people um, working in the land. That way we can make space primarily for burials, but also more room for special species of trees, such as live oaks, uh, sparkleberry trees, hickory trees, so they can have room to grow uh, like they would have thousands of years ago if it wasn't for uh, people um, interrupting uh, and, and changing the landscape for their benefit. And so uh, sometimes people think, well, well, why would we have to go in and, and remove certain species? Uh, but this just goes to the fact that we're trying to bring it back to what it was before. Um, Prairie Creek uh, Conservation Cemetery, part of the land there was previously owned by private entities. Uh, and so the overall health of the environment wasn't really being looked out for. Um, in the center there, you'll see a photo of a young sapling. It's a young pine tree that's starting to grow. Uh, and so after we complete such land work, uh, we then do burials. Um, then we have policies where we could potentially place spouses, parents of a minor in the same area. Uh, after we fill in a particular zone, uh, we can potentially plant native species to rehabilitate uh, that space, create more biodiversity, uh, and then close it off for preservation purposes. So then uh, we will then move on to another zone to go through the exact same system. Ultimately, by the time we're done completing burials, we would have also tended to the land as well. So, so that's one of the goals that we have uh, when, when completing this work. Um, this here uh, is another example of some other forms of engagement that we have with our community. Uh, we have board members, staff, volunteers come out um, and collect seed uh, from the cemetery itself. That way we can plant in other areas uh, to boost the, the overall health of the ecosystem, uh, to attract um, pollinators, other insects back to this area. Uh, and so that's another aspect of, of restoration that we're trying to complete. Um, we're also partners with the Green Burial Council. Uh, and so one of their um, rules for us to maintain this certification as a conservation burial ground is to uh, protect uh, at least a minimum of 20 acres uh, and more of the 93 acres, more than half, I would say, sorry, is dedicated to just preservation and, and conservation. So we really only have about 40 acres uh, to complete burials within. Uh, the other parts of the land um, in these photos you'll see is, is we're trying to bring back uh, by using some, some modern day practices, uh, or you could say traditional techniques as well, such as collecting and, and dispersing. Um, this here is another example of a community planting day uh, that we had uh, with some volunteers out in the cemetery. And this is back out again in the, the meadow ecosystem of Prairie Creek. So these are just a few forms of conservation uh, restoration uh, practices that we have out in the land. Uh, there's plenty more and hopefully we can get to them uh, at the end. Uh, but those are, are the main ones uh, of doing that preliminary land work of, of removing such vegetation uh, that doesn't overall that help the health of the, uh, the space, uh, but then reintroducing species that were once calling this place home that help other plant life and wildlife um, that, that live there. Um, so we had been asked about uh, the link between uh, uh, land conservation and burial. Um, and so, uh, Freddie, if you wish, uh, I can pass it over to you or I can start uh, if you like. Um, sure. The, well, I, I think the when you talk about a link between land conservation and burial, it's somewhat what I've already stated that you know, it's a, it's a fairly new concept, that link, and um, the first conservation burial ground, per se, uh, in South Carolina was somewhere around 1995 or six. Carlos, you may remember specifically, but it's in within a year or two of that. And, um, and the whole, the whole idea came out of Dr. Billy Campbell's, he owned his own land, 
and his father had recently died and his experience with conventional burial in his mind he's a huge um, kind of biologist but also medical doctor knows plants incredibly well and deeply appreciates the environment and uh, and land conservation so in his mind he linked those two up uh, even though in, in Europe they had natural burial going on for a long time but specifically conservation burial was pretty much his his idea and he on his own land started the first conservation burial ground and and you know the it's a very rational and sort of uh no-brainer kind of combination because it has so many benefits and uh, what often is said at prairie creek is that um it, it's not so much about a particular grave site, although that is beautiful and important, just like the photo you see. But look around that grave site, look at everything that surrounds it and all of the life. Therefore, you know, we sort of instill the concept of, of it is a living memorial, the whole space, the whole um, 93 acres and adjacent is um, is a living memorial. And once, you know, a body, a physical body becomes a part of it, you can no longer define um, a specific spot because that life is now a part of life all, uh, all around there and a part of everything. Um, so I think it's a, a beautiful combination that has multiple benefits not the least of which is which we'll talk about it a little bit in a few minutes is it also helps to mitigate climate change <clears throat> yeah i think freddie pretty much um, um hit the nail on the head there with with that description of how it's, it's linked um and so these are just some some more photos of how um completing such burials help us uh, protect uh this this special part of, of, of Florida, and that we hope others can do in the future as well. Um, and so we know that there are other places uh, all around the country um, that are hoping to open similar conservation burial grounds. That way, these spaces are not developed. Uh, and so, um, so we hope um, for whoever does take on that endeavor, um, the, the best. Uh, but this here is uh, an example of some more engagement. Uh, we actually have um, some people come out and give some guided tours uh, in regards to how burial uh, protects such special species out here, such as like elderberry, uh, some of these hickories here. Uh, and so um, this is just one of those classes that's being taught out there. I have some pretty incredible wildlife out in the cemetery. Uh, one of our staff members was able to catch a photo of a bobcat out there and we've been seeing them and they're young which is quite amazing every morning uh, it's, it's quite beautiful to see herds of deer wild turkeys there's a variety of hundreds of birds um, there's uh, insects butterflies snakes bunny rabbits that pop out of nowhere that scare me on the daily basis um, i think freddie had seen like an otter running across cemetery lane from one wetland to another so like he had mentioned before this this place is teeming with life and Whenever people make that decision to, to be buried here for themselves or for a, a relative, it, it helps just further uh, our goals. Um, and so um, climate change and its effects on, on what we're doing, uh, how conservation burial is actually a response to that uh, and us already trying to help mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, but I guess I can just start off because um, I think um, that the main question for this was how do we see or think that climate change will, will have an effect on the overall space and, and operations. And uh, I know for myself, it can seem quite daunting um, or at some times depressing thinking about all the changes that the world are, is going through uh, with the increase of, of the temperature, uh, with the loss of certain species of plants and wildlife. Um, and, and why we're, we're still doing what we're doing. And for me personally, I feel we need to do what we can uh, to help people and, and the environment. So uh, with that, 
we, we do see a change uh, down here in Florida. Uh, we had a really hot summer, uh, but we're also expecting a really cold fall winter. So it's for us, we're trying to figure out uh, the best ways of uh, restoring the land and specifically like if we're planting native species that once thrived here during certain temperatures, we're trying to think about that, of how we're reintroducing species where specifically in the land, um, how we're taking care of our employees during the, those really hot months. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that climate change is, is certainly having an effect on just operations, but we're also trying to uh, make sure that people are aware of this choice by providing um, informational sessions, sessions such as these. That way, a lot more people can know about this option. Um, there is only probably a small percentage of people, I would think there was a study out saying that only 30% of people over the age of 70 know about uh, this option or, or other green burial options. And so that was definitely a, a staggering uh, number. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some other ones, but I'm gonna let Freddie have some time in case he wanted to review climate change and natural burial um, uh, before we, we keep going. Yeah, I think in terms of climate change, obviously, once again, um, conservation burial is, is one of the mitigators uh, and it's, uh, you know, there's so many cultural things and habits and ways of life that we need it's important for us to start uh, evaluating and making changes in order to mitigate climate change. Uh, and, and any of them that, that are is something that everybody eventually has to do, those kind of decisions as in death care. Um, it's, it's sort of a low hanging fruit, if you will, because it's such an easy, easy choice that has many benefits and people, a large percentage of folks, once they, to Carlos's point, once they understand it and see what it is, it's a choice they're excited about and, 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 it, and it's accompanied with many other benefits. So, so it really is, um, for that reason, um, a climate change mitigator. But on the other hand, climate change is going to happen to it as well. Uh, and I think um, the perspective that that I have in terms of looking at how we might adapt to climate change, once again, conservation barrel and the way and what it represents, it has a lot of resilience. Obviously, we can get more detailed and find out particularly what species we might need less of or more of. We have to uh, continue to evaluate how to keep people involved as climate change happens. And we also have to be uh, cognizant that, you know, climate change somewhere down the road could, um, you know, change the that entire space at Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery. But there again, because of the natural barrel component of it, it, it doesn't create another problem it's all a part of uh, of the best scenario at the time because it's all nature and uh you know even the worst case scenario we're still better off than with a lot of other choices of, of death care so uh, i'm gonna uh, pause us there um i encourage you to to check out um you know, if you look on either the Green Burial Council's website or even an organization that I haven't mentioned yet, the Conservation Burial Alliance, which does their own version of um, education advocacy um, work, you can find links to these other uh, burial grounds and, and see what they're up to. I find it inspiring and I love getting to see what it looks like in other other ecosystems, too. Yeah. Um, so I, I welcome your uh, questions or thoughts while we're here together. Are there any more questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Great. Nothing more in the chat. Um, not that I saw. No. Okay, yeah. Marianne, thank you ever so much for this great presentation and, and bringing in other options from other locations as well. That's very helpful. 
Yeah. And I want to remind everybody that on March 20th, we're going to have our next Ollie Brown Bag Lunch on Healthy Living for Brain and Body from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, learn about research and everyday activities supporting longevity. And please remember that when you get your invitation, <clears throat> um, to keep that email and forward it and put it on your calendar because that's going to be your link uh, to join. And if all else fails, if you happen to lose that email for some reason, you can always go online to humble.edu slash Ollie and go to the Brown Bag Lunch program and uh, the link will also be there. So it's the same link. It will be the same link every time, every program. So keep your hands on it <laughs> Yeah. Okay. so you don't lose it, so you don't miss these wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Jane. See you all. Bye. Thank you.